my case is probably a stranger to none of you, but uh, <laughs> uh, just in case not all of you know him, he's a local boy uh, who graduated from Parkside High School, uh, went on to have a double life, went to the University of Maryland. I don't know if that began a double life or not, but uh, he uh, graduated in, in some area in the sciences, but his heart was always with history. I guess that's safe. Right. right? Uh, he is employed at uh, NASA at Wallops Island, Virginia, uh, working on all kinds of sensitive <coughs> national issues, which I don't ask him about. <laughs> Uh, he is just as accomplished in history, having written a well-documented book on Adam Hitch, the founder of the Hitch family here on the Eastern Shore, for which he received an award. He has co-authored a volume of Civil War letters written by one of his ancestors called O Lordy. Uh, it includes hundreds of letters of the Civil War ancestor in South Carolina, which he, uh, along with a, a relative of his, have transcribed. Uh, and made available to people who are interested. The originals of those hundreds of letters are now at the NAB Center uh, at SU. Uh, our multifaceted speaker has, uh, along with, uh, as you'll find out today, John Lyon, uh, examined all the patents of the Lower Eastern Shore of Maryland and Lower Delaware. <coughs> Mike uh, and John Lyon have compiled a map of land holdings of all of Lower Delmarva, the first such map to have been created. One which shows that Maryland patents went all the way north as far as Dover, Delaware, placing a substantial part of Sussex and Kent Counties, Delaware, within Maryland's grasp. Mike has traced many local lines of his family back to the 17th century on Delmar. I think that's safe to say. Thirteen generations of ancestors. Uh, he is presently the chair of the NAB uh, Board uh, of Directors, and he has continued his love of local history and research studying the origins of early <coughs> settlements here on the Eastern Shore. Uh, wherever there is local history to be found, Mike is usually there spearheading efforts to record and disseminate historical information of his beloved Eastern Shore. And that's why he's here this afternoon to share with us some of his uh, historical findings. He's going to be talking about Wicomico County through the lands of extant land records. Mike. Thank you, Ray. And, and I can't let it go without introducing Ray and Sylvia. Ray and Sylvia were the original founders of the NAB Center way back in the early 80s, but they were only like 15 years old then, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't, I can't thank them enough for recognizing the need to preserve Delmarva history and culture, and I, I really appreciate that. So that's why it's a no-brainer for me to come here and continue on that tradition uh, to some extent. So anyway, uh, we're, I, I got the projector working. Now, hopefully everybody can see it pretty well. I've got like 40 slides here, about 25 with meat in them. So I gotta, I gotta work through a lot of information, but feel free to ask a question every now and if you, if you see something that looks interesting to you, uh, speak up. Um, I'm a pretty big mouth myself, so I expect others to be that way too. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about, so, so anybody that's done genealogical history or local history in the past, especially genealogies, knows that you, get, you can get so far with the census records and, um, and Bible records and cemetery records and visiting cemeteries, but then, then you run into a roadblock lots of times. Starting about the federal period, before 1850, the census didn't go into a lot of detail except heads of household and, and things like that. So where do you turn? Um, two, thing, two things I found very useful, and I'm, I'm not talking about one today, is the old judicial records. We're very fortunate that old Somerset County still has judicial records from the um, 17th century up through the revolution and that kind of thing. So you can find some tidbits there, but one great area is through the land records. Um, and, and if you follow the land, if your ancestor owned land, a lot didn't, but a lot did, then you can follow the genealogy of the land and make inferences about how the, the family history evolved as well. And then get some clues and tie it all together through, uh, through uh, facts through the actual uh, primary source records. So I'm gonna talk about some of that today and let me get started. Okay, so Old Somerset, most people don't even realize this. This is, this is the entirety of Old Somerset County, Maryland. It includes modern Wicomico, modern Somerset, modern Worcester, and a lot of people used to think that from the Indian River over to Laurel South in Sussex was Old Somerset. We found that actually Old Somerset runs almost up to Dover. Um, and Maryland ran all the way up to the Kent County line roughly in Delaware, um, but west of the Marshy Hope Creek was Dorchester County generally, and then the rest was Old Somerset. And then in 1742, Worcester was formed, Worcester County, and it roughly split this down the middle. 
It's not exact, but it split down the middle, and to the east was Worcester, and to the west was Somerset. And then Wicomico was formed in 18, relatively late in 1867. So John Lyon, very interesting character, um, um, did, was working on his family history and, um, uh, in the 90s. And uh, I, I ran into him uh, in the year 2000. I had just gotten laid off from a job working with an internet company. Remember the internet companies went bust? I was so burned out, I just took like four months and did nothing. And I went to the Hall of Records, and there sits this guy, this old fellow, happened to work for NASA, believe it or not. I wasn't even thinking about working for NASA at the time. And he was sitting there, and he was looking at these piles of papers, boxes of papers that were old land patents of old Somerset County. So I got talking to him about some of this stuff, and, uh, and we collaborated on some stuff. So there's a lot of words here. I won't go into it a lot, but another, another fellow there, who, who some of you may know is a guy named John Polk. He's a, another historian, um, really detailed. He's written a, a, a good book on the Polks uh, of, uh, of the Eastern Shore. Um, and he's in the Order of Cincinnati, so he traces his roots back to uh, uh, officers in the Revolution uh, and that kind of thing. So he and John and I are like the triumvirate that worked together on these land records. John was a nucleus of it and did most of the legwork, but John Polk, John Lyon, and John Polk and I supported supported John in, in uh, transcribing old patents and that kind of stuff. So, and we found out in the old patent records, if you ever, and I'll show you one later, that there's not just the land and the, and the talking about it, but it'll talk about family history and how people come up, uh, 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 inherited something, and this was owned by this guy because he was, his, his wife was a daughter of this other guy, you know, so it's a lot of rich history there. So let me get into more of this. So here's what John did. In 1997, he did like 100 properties trying to solve his own genealogy. Now, I can relate to that because and Ned can probably relate this as well. I found that one of my hitches, Isaac Hitch, said it was in, he was in Somerset County. And, I, and, and then he shows up in, in uh, Sussex County. I'm like, well, he moved, right? And no, he didn't move. Just Sussex overcame that land. So, so that became, a, and, and, and we're, we're lucky and unlucky here in that you, you, can, you could have lived in Somerset, Worcester, and Sussex and never have moved, the, your family. So... Uh, that became, a, that became a challenge to try to get through that. And then he started doing some regional mapping of Wicomico after I told him the Hall of Records wasn't completely right because I knew where this one tract of land was, was in Worcester County and the Somerset County border, modern. And John goes, no, it's in Wicomico. The Hall of Records says it's in Wicomico now. I'm like, no, it's not. I know exactly where it is. So then, then he started digging more and saying, oh, we can do better than this. So that's what we did. And then in the year 2000, remember, that's when I was laid off. For four months, I sat there and transcribed records with him. And then he, he, this guy is a perfectionist and an obsessive compulsive like me. So he basically did 12,000 or so land patents. And not just the land patent records, but he also looked at the deed records for all these counties and brought all those land patents up to date to the revolution. So in other words, if a land patent was, was granted in 1675, he tracked every time something was sold within that land patent up to the revolution. So lots of very valuable information. And then in 2010, I got obsessive and compulsive and started working on Delaware Sussex County patent records. Um, many people don't know, uh, everybody knows about the Mason-Dixon line. It's right out here, the cornerstone's right, right up the road here. But, um, and everybody knows Mason-Dixon roughly did their survey in 1763. Well, many people don't know that the Trans Peninsula Line was put in first from the middle point of the Eastern Shore, when the middle point's right out here, over to Fenwick Island, and it was laid out in 1750. So technically, Delaware was north of that line in 1750, but Delaware never, never made claim to their land until about 1776. And in the meantime, Jeremiah, uh, uh, Charles and Jeremiah, right, uh, Mason Dixon did their 1763 survey across to the middle point and up north to Pennsylvania and across that way. So then it all came together, and then Delaware started uh, claiming their land and about the revolution. So that's what I did, is from the revolution to about 1800, there's a lot of land patents. So, so John, and I'll show you more of that. I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that in a minute. So, 
Okay, so here gives you an idea of the extent of this. Here, and I didn't include Delaware here, but all of Wicomico, Worcester, and Somerset, and Sussex, each one of those little color things are a land patent. And it represents a roughly 12,000 of them there on those two slides. And each, each of those, those 12,000 probably has, on an average, 30 pieces of information related to it. So you're talking about half a million pieces of valuable information that are in this database. So it gives you some, some semblance of the magnitude of this thing. So anyway, here's, here's a, a, a typical land patent, and this happens to be, I, I didn't do a Su Sussex one, but this happens to be out of this, I mean a Somerset one, this happened to be out of Sussex, uh, after Sussex took control of old Somerset land. And I picked this one, it's called Hitch's Chance, and it was made for Isaac Hitch, and some key information here, the blue there, so when, when you got a land patent, first you had a warrant, um, was issued, that, that, that gave you the, uh, the right to make a survey. And then a survey was made, and then after the survey was made, you could, you could take possession of the land if, as long as you paid rent on it, okay? You paid your, your duty on it, and then your patent was awarded. So this warrant, this survey was made the 17th of November, 1793, just to show you. And, uh, and the patent was awarded October, 1794. So in this, you'll see meets and bounds, and meets and bounds are just directional lines of how the lines of the patent lay out. And then, uh, and then it tells you the acreage. This happens to be 165 acres, 3.51 perches, which means something to a surveyor, might not mean much to the acreage would, would. And then the plat, actually the plat here is the, the map of the land. So that shows you, um, um, and it's in Little Creek 100, and so it, basic information. So from that, reading that writing from 1793, we would, here's what we started with, we would enter this computerized data and it, the, the computer would show you what the plat looked like. And then you took that plat and fitted it into like a jigsaw puzzle in with the rest of the plats that had already been done. And, and it's not exact jigsaw puzzle because the parts don't fit exactly together, but, uh, but it's close. So to give you an idea of this, here's Sussex County and all the, all the land patents that we've done in Sussex County. Here's that, <laughs> here's that patent I just showed you, that uh, Hitch's Chance. So it's a, it's a little piece of land down here in the southwest corner of Sussex County. And it, believe it or not, it does fit within, uh, um, it, it does fit within its surrounding, uh, surrounding patents. So, backtrack a little bit. Old Somerset was formed in 1666 and consisted of all the uh, land areas of modern Somerset, Worcester, Wacomico, and nearly two-thirds of Sussex. Um, taking the tracks, and this is going to be interesting in the next couple of slides, the taking of the tracks generally started in the 1666 time frame along the waterways. You know, the old uh, colonists would settle along the waterways looking for places to grow their tobacco and put them in hogsheads and roll them down to the river and get them on ship to England. And then they'd load up with goods in England, uh, you know, earthenware and that kind of stuff and bring it back here. So that, that's, they would settle along the waterways. That was the main, main uh, form of trans, uh, or transportation back then. Most of the land had been patented by the time of the Re Revolution. There were some stragglers that went on into the eight, uh, 19th century. And then, uh, and then the Lion database gives us interesting glimpses in the settlement patterns over the years. And I'm going to show this. So here is Wicomico County I just singled out. And this is the only land patents that were made by, 17, um, by 1670. And you can see they're along the Wicomico River, Barren Creek Spring, uh, Barren Creek, excuse me, uh, Wicomico Creek. At, at this time, Wacomico Creek was actually the Wacomico River, and the Wacomico River is a rock walking river, but, uh, but you can see the settlement pattern. And then over time, you'll see, and I'll show you in the next few slides, they expand away from the waterways and then inland and fill out the whole, um, fill out the whole map. So if you look 1680, 1690, 1700, so, so you've you got to remember now that Worcester, they're expanding from the inland bays in, in and at the same time, and Somerset also. So they're going to meet in the middle here. So by 1700, and that's 1710, and then go through this really quick. So you can see how they're filling in from the water inland. 
And then this west of Micomico, even by the time the dawn of the revolution, you still got a big, wide open area that hadn't been, hadn't been uh, patented yet. And then 1780, 90, and 1800, almost everything's there. There's a, there's a few pockets that haven't been patented yet. And then you go to the modern map, and there it's all filled in. So uh, people have asked me, if there, are there any holes I found? <laughs> there's a couple holes there, but I, but I, I don't think they're worth anything. And, 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 and there was a, a, a load of patents that, that came out in the 1940s. Some guy from Baltimore came down and started patenting all the marshland. <laughs> which is probably underwater now, most of it, but uh, so th th there, was, there was, that was happening. So what's interesting, and I wish I, you could see this better, but it does give you an idea. From the database of that Wacomico County that I just showed you, I can do a search. Say I want to search on Hitch. I can, I can, I can tell the, the database, say, tell me all the patents that say Hitch, and it'll, it'll pop them all up. Now, Unfortunately, it's not as accurate as you might be like you hitch a wagon, you know? So it's only gonna find the pattern hitch, it's not gonna find the name hitch. So what I did, what I've shown here is, here's landowners as of, okay, so you can do by date, we already saw by date. Here's landowners in this area. Here, we're right roughly here now. So you can't see the names of the landowners, but here's all the landowners here in 1670. Um, here I did Wacomico and searched on dwelling houses. So all those patents there mention somebody's dwelling house, okay? So you can go, and, and unfortunately you don't know if it's 1800 or if it's 1680, but you can say, oh, I, like this right here, that's Adam Hitchland, you know? Is there a dwelling house? Well, it turns out there's a dwelling house there on that, and, uh, and it's, it's right there in Centennial Village, and that's where Adam's buried underneath somebody's backyard, I'm sure. <laughs> um, landings, landings are important, you know, get your tobacco to market, and so all the landings, not surprisingly, this is all along waterways, but, but landings were important, and we'll get into more detail on that later, and mills, so lots of mills around, mills are important, grist mills, saw mills, uh, all kinds of mills going on there, and most of them, obviously most of them are water powered, <clears throat> I think practically all of them are water powered. So, how do you take this extensive tool and use it to your advantage? So, I grew up in Fruitland, outside of Fruitland on St. Luke's Road. So I'm always interested in Fruitland history. So I, I, I just came up with hypothetical questions. What was Fruitland like around the time of revolution? What can the land records tell me? Uh, and, uh, and, and how can these tools help? Well, you can't see very well here, but Fruitland is here. And look at, all those land, look at all those land patents. So now we need to use our search, our search feature. Okay, so background. Fruitland began, it was called Bisharoon's Crossroads in the 18th century. And, uh, and it changed to Forktown in 1820. And in 1873, the post office named it Fruitland. I think an odd sidelight is the choices were Phoenix or Fruitland. And, uh, they picked Fruitland, so we could have been from Phoenix, Maryland, for God's sake. But I think there was already another Phoenix there already. The town lies mostly within the bounds of this. We're lucky in this respect, and I'll get into this more in the next slide. So what I didn't show you, let me, let me go back. I want to show you this real quick. So you see these green boxes here, this, this, and this. This right here is Puckamy Indian Village, so that was an Indian reservation that was set up. These green boxes were... Lord Baltimore's reserved land that he kept. So he said, all you English people, I want you to go settle on my land and pay me rent, but I don't want you to settle on those areas because I'm reserving it for my own use, if I want to. And so, now we can go back to the next one. Sorry, I don't want to make you dizzy here, but. So, Fruitland, or Lucky, it lies within one of those manors. It, it lies within Wacomico Manor and Wacomico Manor ran from roughly Main Street in Fruitland, north and east to uh, downtown Salisbury, where the, where the, li the Wacomico Library is, roughly. And it ran from the Wacomico River on the west, uh, southeast to about where the bypass is now, roughly. So just really rough 
And it was laid out in 1674. There was an error, and I'll, I'll show you this later, that resurveyed it in 1756. But what's really key about things within this manor is 1771, Lord, Lord Baltimore hadn't, his, his great grandson hadn't used the land in all these years. So in 1771, he says, okay, you guys can have it. Just pay me 25 pounds sterling for every 100 acres that you, you lay out for yourself. And so in 1772, there were lots of tracts that were laid out within the Wicomico Manor. Now, what's important about that for this is all of them were laid out in 1772. So you're, not, you're, not, you're getting a contemporary look of what it looked like in 1772, not one's 1710, one's 1760, one's 1800. So you're getting a real look of what it looked like. So here, I'll go back to the database, and I, and I started, I started um, uh, filtering. And here's the Wicomico Manor. Like I said, I had, I had it roughly right. And here's the land tracts that are in current Fruitland. And you'll see names like it's hard to read, Come By Chance, Watson's Discovery, Havana, Chambers Purchase, Bachelor's Folly. That guy was a bachelor, by the way, when he, uh, when he got there. Um, Mill Lot, a couple other things. So, and 1772, and this, this is interesting because there's a couple here that aren't. And it, it goes back to that question that this, this original layout of this manor was incorrect. So, so you can't see, this is Fruitland, it's hard to see, but this, this, this line right here is St. Luke's Road. This line is Meta Bridge Road, and this is a tract of land called Disharoon's Adventure. Remember, it's called Disharoon's Crossroads before? So in 1772, George Disharoon had to track Disharoon's Adventure, surveyed for him, this is all in the database, on March 12, 1772, for 123 and a quarter acres. And it is described in part in Worcester and part in Somerset. Remember, Worcester was formed in 1742, so 30 years after Worcester had been formed. This is Division Street. Division Street meant it divided Somerset from Worcester back then. So right, right there. So this is Division Street. This is Ventures, part in Somerset, part in Worcester back then. So you can see that. Um, I, I like this part of it because it's interesting because the, the land out there is not really great farmland. So it says, the survey said improvements are 120 acres of cultivated land, half under fence, half unfenced and consists of white sandy soil that's worn out. <laughs> so, probably worn out from growing tobacco. You know, tobacco would wear the land out. And, um, and they didn't know about crop rotation as much back then, so uh, that's, that's probably what did it. Plus it was sandy anyway, so it's not all that conducive to good crop growth. This room never received a royal patent, because what happened, right after 1772, was, all tensions started rising with England, and Lord Baltimore wasn't doing anything over here. So it's, it, it laid unpatented. And then after the revolution in 1783, the, the commissioners of the state of Maryland said, all the tracts on Wacomico Manor are now confiscated British property and awarded Disharoon's adventure to George Disharoon for 27 pounds, 12 shillings, 6 pence um, at the original rate of 25 pounds sterling per 100 acres. And I'm not sure if that would be pound sterling anymore. It would be, it'd be uh, money of Maryland. But, uh, but he got his patent. So he, I'm, I'm not going to go into a lot of this, but George Disharoon was the brother of Francis Disharoon. Both were sons of John and grandsons of John Disharoon Sr. John Disharoon Sr. had his land right next to that, that uh, Disharoon's adventure that you just saw. So now you can see why Fruitland was originally called Disharoon's Crossroads. And... Um, he was already living in a house that had descended to him from his father. The house near a second figure is Brown Street and Meta Bridge Road on modern day. I wish I could go do some archaeology there, but that's probably where all these people are buried. And John Disharoon Sr., the one that patented the original land in 1713, is my eighth great grandfather. And anybody that lives near Fruitland, I guarantee you're probably related to that same guy. So we're cousins. Um, Okay, so I won't go into that, any of that anymore. So here, here's the other land tracks that I showed you. And I won't, I won't go into a lot of detail, but you'll see names. Robert Layfield. Layfields are still on, around Fruitland. Um, he had a survey called tra uh, Choice. 
Improvements were 20 acres of cultivated land under fence, a log house, 16 by 12. So this is, this is what's really cool about the cultural aspects of this. Now, now, you, now you can see what the community looked like in 1772, a 16 by 12 house. Man, that's about half the size of this room, you know? 50 apple trees, white sandy soil timbered with small pine trees. Uh, to Layfields East was a guy named John Chambers. He lived right there by where Walmart is today in, in Fruitland. Um, uh, improvements, 50 acres cultivated land under fence, 130 small apple trees, a log house 16 by 32, so he's twice the size of the other guy, and another log house 16 by 16, and another log house 8 by 8. So he probably had family members living there and or indentured servants or slaves, who, who knows, timbered with small pines. To his east, Stephen Toadvine. Toadvine is, is a name that's still, still there today. Uh, he had surveyed mill lot. Well, there was a mill there where Morris Mill Pond is today, originally owned by the Toadvine family. And he was the only one that had a framed house, not a log house, 20 by 16 framed house. He also had a log house and uh, small pines, white sandy soil. Across in back of where the old Ames department store used to be, William Adams surveyed addition for 61 and a quarter acres, and on his land was a frame house and a sawmill. Well, right there where, where uh, Camden Avenue crosses uh, Tony Tank, there was a mill for, since 1772 at least, probably long, long before that. And then, uh, and then Alexander Porter, who was a bachelor, actually patented bachelor's folly, and he was over uh, at the mouth of Tony Tank. So, so that gives, gives you a good idea and then I'll, I'll wrap the Fruitland discussion up by looking at this. So now you can take that land tract uh, uh, depiction that I had on the, on the regular map, that normal maps you see, you can export it so you can import it into Google Earth in a satellite view. So you, it's hard to read this, and I can give you some copies of this later, but here's all these land tracts on a satellite view of the land today. So again, George Disheron originally patented this. His house is roughly in here somewhere. You can almost pinpoint within probably about 100 or 200 feet of where his house was. And the white line here is that old Bicomico Manor. <clears throat> and just to show you more, um, so if you search in the land record database on Manor, Wicomico Manor, these tracks come up. And it's oddly, it's oddly funny, it's following a nice rectangular shape, but it's not, it's not following the shape that the 1674 sur survey showed. So this is something that Ray and John and John and I worked on this, this winter. This was confusing us a little bit. And John Lyon happened to say, well, I remember one time I saw a 1756 plat of the Wicomico Manor, and we got to find out that one. So I, I bought it from 35 bucks from the Hall of Records. You know, I could have gone up there and gotten it for free. But I figured $35 round trip, go ahead and give them, send it to me. So if you look at this, this, you gotta remember, this is oriented sideways. So you gotta imagine this turned around um, and it shows you the land tracks on here, you can't read them. But it shows this is the original, like this, and then this little dotted line saying, oops, the surveyor messed up in 1674 and it should be like this. So we actually proved out something in hindsight, without even knowing we proved something, and then went back and found out that we proved it. So <laughs> it's kind of interesting. And so just, just to close the loop on the Fruitland story, what I did was I took um, that 1756 plat and drew some, some lines on here. This line here, the uh, yellow line is Division Street, modern day Division Street. So. This side was Somerset, this side was Worcester County. Again, it's turned around. John Disheroon's living here. This red star, that's where Fruitland City Hall is today on the, on the corner of, um, of Meadowbridge Road and Main Street and, um, and Division Street. Um, you see Robert Chambers, Robert Layfield we talked about, Henry Todevin now. Henry was Stephen's father, so that's, that's, you know, he's got a mill here, you can't see it, but, it, but it's, that's Morris Mill Pond. This blue star here, is Venables Mill. Venables Mill existed right where the Wicomico County Library is today at, in Salisbury. So that's downtown Salisbury. Um, this, this is Snow Hill Road. Same thing in 1756, almost the same track. 
Division Street the same way. This is called the Road to Princess Anne. Well, that's Division Street extended in Fruitland, and it goes on down south to uh, Princess Anne. So, so amazing things you can find out with the land records. All right, now I'm going to go do some West Side stuff, since you guys hear from West Side. I'll do the West Side story, pardon the pun. <laughs> so my mom, who's sitting here, her mom was an Elliot, and Elliot's from Delmar area. Yeah, she thought she was from Wilmington. I'm like, nah, I don't think so. You went to Wilmington for a while, but, but it was Elliot's originally were from the Delmar area. And so I, got, I traced all the way back to this guy named Daniel Elliott, um, who patented land, I found out, in uh, 1756 called Daniel's Beginning. And he had patented another piece of land in 1760 called uh, Elliot's Edition, which is Elliot's Edition. And they were right just east of where modern Delmar, Delaware is, just north of the, of the Maryland-Delaware line. Um, I had no idea who his parents were. And I, I found some nebulous record online that said his parents were John, and, uh, John Elliott and Mary Melson. I'm like, well, how, am I, how am I supposed to believe that without facts to back it up? But I said, it's interesting that they say that. So I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to find out more about that. So also, in the past year, I've really gotten into doing a lot of the Eastern Shore of Virginia records, which are rich in history as well. So a fellow named Ralph Whitelaw published two-volume set of land records in, the, the, in Northampton and Accomack County. And so Whitelaw did it in 1968. So he did this a long time ago before computers. Uh, so it's a, it's a monumental work. The good thing is he did all that land record stuff. The bad thing is, he tried to mix genealogy in with it, and he was halfway successful. He's got a lot of errors. So, but in, in that, and, and it's hard to read this red, it said Samuel Melson, okay, make sure I got this right. Samuel Melson and wife Margaret of Nanticoke, this is down in Accomack, sold 75 acres of land in 1719 to Thomas Wilkinson down in Accomack County, and then in 1719, Samuel's purchasing land called Partner's Choice from William Robinson up here in the old Somerset. So why is Partner's Choice in, any, anything to worry about here? Well, it's, it's right down the street here. Um, some more background, because I'm trying to find the Melsons and see if they're related to the Elliots. And just showing an example, John Melson married Elizabeth Painter in old Somerset. So, we're lucky in that the old land records of Somerset give a lot of genealogical information early on. So it actually says in there, in more cryptic 17th century terms, that John Melson married Elizabeth Painter on April the 4th, 1672. And they had children Samuel, John, Jr., and Joseph. So remember, trying to find the Melsons. So, and we know Samuel really relocated to Maryland. I just showed you that he sold his land in Virginia and bought land in Maryland in 1719. So does this make so John Melson Jr., this guy, his brother, left a will on the 30th day of December, 1736, in Virginia. And two tidbits of really cool information. I mean, to son Daniel, old musket, that's kind of cool to me too. But to daughter Mary Elliot, one shilling sterling, her full portion. So she was evidently taken care of with other stuff. But thank God he mentioned Mary Elliot as his daughter here, because that figures into the story. And the other thing is, in 1736, he says, if I die at the house of my son Daniel, he can have my coat, my vest, my pair of shoes and stockings, and a fine shirt and my hat. <laughs> so he wasn't in Accomack, or he, may, he wasn't local to his own house. He was at his son Daniel's house. May have been because he was sick or just there and got sick. Who knows? But kind of neat information. So I did a search on, on Melson in the land record database. So all these hotspots showed up from Melson. So here's my peeps here east of Del Mar in this cluster of land. And that's where Elliot's were too, by the way. So Elliot's and Melson's were together. There's a big cluster up here, which I, I don't go into on this one. And this is Partner's Choice. Samuel Melson bought in 1719. Well, if you look at this, we are here. We're sitting right here. So right down Route 50, a little ways, about a mile, Partner's Choice actually straddled Route 50 down there. So that's, that's the land that Samuel Melson bought. 
If you pick apart the land records even more and look at the, um, look at the, uh, the um, text behind the map, there's lots of neat information about how the land was sold and bought. But in 1738, no, 1740, the will was proven by the last will and testament of Samuel Melson. His dwelling plantation, which is partner's choice, that we're on partner's choice, went to his son Samuel Melson. So Samuel died in roughly 1740, and he gives this land out here to his son Samuel. So Samuel Jr. I hope I'm not jumping over back and forth too much. So now, now we've proved that Samuel's up here, and I, I wanted to, um, to go more into the West Side story here again. So it's also in, in the cluster of land here that Melson popped up with nearby here, one is just called Malele's Folly. And what, the only reason it popped up is it was Patrick McLally, I think. Um, but the only reason it popped up is it mentions a Melson's Landing in the, in the track. It says, the first boundary of the land is a cedar post in the marsh across Barren Creek from Melson's Landing. So I'm like, where in the heck is that? That's kind of cool. West side, again, right down the road, right, right on Barren Creek. So we can take the magic of exporting to Google Earth. Hard to see here, but this red line is partner's choice. Here's Route 50. Here's the old Route 50 to the Vienna Bridge. Uh, so, and so here's Malele's Folly across. That point is the first boundary of that land. And that point said in the land record, Cedar Post in the marsh across from Barren Creek from Melson's Landing. Well, guess where Melson's Landing was? Right there. And I zoomed in on this. I, I don't know if people live around here. There's tables and chairs were set up there for some kind of wedding or something when this picture happened to be taken. So there's a, still a landing there of some sort uh, along Barren Creek. So it, it's very interesting. You can zero in on things like that. And roughly, the, this, this was patented in 1763. So there, Melson's Landing was still there in 1763. Samuel Sr. had died in 1740, but he had left the, this land to his son, Samuel. So there's still a Melson's Landing there, and it's known by that name. But it's long, long since gone from history as far as that name is concerned. <clears throat> So now let's go back just to, just to show you. I, I wanted to close the loop here to show you how I, I, I took the land records and, and figured out the connections. So we, we found Samuel Melson. Well, the, the, the Melsons here are Daniel Melson. Okay, so remember, remember, remember John when he died, he said, if I die at my son's Daniel Melson's house, then he can have all, all my, all my uh, apparel, basically. Um, so Daniel Melson's here. So Daniel Melson had patented land, Good Hope and Glady Ground in the 1730s here, about the same time that John, John Sr. dies. Well, it's John Jr. dies. John Sr. was the, the father of all of them. So I'm almost positive John, the, the father of Daniel, died here and, and got buried and, and gave his clothes to his son, you know, because back then you didn't bury with your clothes. You just buried in a shroud usually with pins or something like that. So the clothes were very valuable. So John's, John, the, the very senior John's son, Samuel's here. He has a son, Joseph. Remember him? is here. John Jr. doesn't leave Vacamac. He leaves a will that says, my daughter, Mary, Mel my Mary Elliot, and Daniel Melson, my son, can have my clothes. My daughter only gets one shilling. She's already been taken care of. Well, Mary, Mary Elliot had married John Elliot, and that's, that's how they end up here. So, so all, all his kids are, are they had moved up north here, and, you, and it's proven by the land records. Not beyond a shadow of a doubt, but it's enough to, to, to convict somebody in court, I think. <laughs> um, you can't see, that th this, is, this is actually a blow up of this area here, showing Daniel Melson. Th these, these two tracks are Daniel Melson's tracks that he patented in 1743 and 1750. Um, they straddle the Maryland-Delaware line, which is called the West Line back then, the Trans-Peninsular Line. Um, and what's really neat about this and, and here's Daniel's beginning. Remember I told you that Daniel Elliott 
patented land, so he's right there. It, it, it's, it's, you know, as we say in the engineering world, it's proof positive that uh, the science experiment worked. Well, when, when they ran this transpeninsular line, um, if, if you know the history, they put, um, they put uh, concrete or m marble markers every five miles. They put one mile? You got one out here? You got one out here? <laughs> We're not on the line, though. I'm just kidding. <laughs> every five miles. And, and the, when the, sur the surveyors, when they started over in Fenwick and headed this way, or yeah, they headed this way because this is mile 25. Um, they said, I'm, I'm next to this guy's house, I'm in the middle of the swamp, I'm the, you know, and they, and they basically were very descriptive. Well, in that Transpeninsular Journal, when they were doing this, it says, when they laid down the west line, the boundary between Delaware, not to confuse things too much, in 1750 they considered north of that line Pennsylvania for a while, because the lower counties of Pennsylvania. Uh, and Maryland, so they said the boundary between Pennsylvania and Maryland, and for uh, May 21st, 1751, it says the placement of the 25 mile marker, milestone, fixed in the field belonging to Daniel Melson, where the chimney is north 38.25 east, 31 perches, 16.8 lengths from his chimney. So you've got an exact location. I mean, I, you can't be more exact than that of this guy's house in 1751, right there. Literally probably 400 feet north of the Maryland-Delaware line. So, and, and this, this is not in the land record database, but this leads you to this, and then you can find out more about it. So anyway, you see the power of this. And, and so here's, here's again my Melsons. John, who's in Accomack, and Mary Elizabeth Painter down in Pocomoke. They had sons, Samuel, John, and Joseph. This big cluster up here is Joseph. It's a different Melson line that I wasn't too concerned with. Mine's John Jr. who has Daniel, and John dies at his house and leaves his clothes. Mary Melson married John Elliott, who's Di Daniel Elliott, who's Samuel Elliott, who's Jacob Elliott, who's Benjamin Elliott, who's William Elliott, who is what's the, uh, Samuel Webb Elliott, who is my grandmother Florence Elliott. <laughs> That's how far out comes down the line. And I think that's it. Any questions? I, I, I kind of get in. Engineering and history are kind of a lot alike because they're, they're kind of exacting and, and you want to be, you know, you, you don't want to cut corners when you're launching a rocket or, or designing a rocket circuit. And you don't want to cut corners really when you're doing history either. You want, you want to get it as accurate as possible. So I have a blog now called MikeHitchBlog.com. So I try to do at least a blog post every two to four weeks. So, I mean, if you're just getting started, go to the census records, go to cemetery records, go to Bible records, church records, whatever. And then, and then when you get stuck, then you can start thinking about this as something to do. Or if people have used it to do, uh, I think John has worked with uh, people looking for Native American sites. Um, uh, pre-Columbian pre woodland sites, that kind of stuff. Um, I know some guys are using it for metal detecting, which I, I don't really help them too much on that, <laughs> unless, unless they're going to do it professionally and get archaeologists involved and that kind of thing, uh, because we don't want this stuff disturbed. John has committed to giving this to the NAB Center. And John's not in the greatest of health. He's, I mean, I don't know how old he is now. He's in his 80s. Um, but he is a... Um, He's a perfectionist, I mean, and, and so he's committed to giving it, but he don't want to give it to us right. And he's one of these perfectionists that's never going to be right. Now, that being said, I've got a copy of all the data. But so if, if people have specific questions, you can always write me. If you go to MikeHitsBlog.com, my email and everything's right there, you can, you can contact me that way. Like if, if, you've come, if, you, if you're looking at your history and you say, well, my ancestor John Smith patented land called Idiot's Choice, and it's in Sussex somewhere near Laurel. Well, give me that information and I'll look it up and, uh, and, and send you an image back or whatever, that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and what we're good is, say, okay, you're going to start at a white oak and you're going to head northeast 30 degrees west. Uh, for 160 perches, and it's going to cross between Thomas More's land and Fred Smith's land. And so now you know that 
Okay, Fred Smith owned land. Okay, now we know his patent, so you can sort of put them together that way. And interesting, in Rock of Walken, um, when Adam Hitch, he, he bought High Suffolk, and then he patented Come By Chance in 1700. And one of the, land, one of the markers there was an old, stooping, crooked white oak tree. Well, if, if you know one of the roads right there, it's called Crooked Oak Lane. So the, the things have left over over the years. And, and they'll mention things like meeting houses, churches, like this was probably called a meeting house back in its day. Um, the old ferry, you know, Upper Ferry, Whitehaven Ferry, um, those things are mentioned. Some oddball markers are, we found one that says a cannonball buried in the marsh. So that's a marker somewhere. Uh, lot, the trees died, and they'll say, a pine tree sapling growing in the, bar, uh, the trunk of an old pine tree that used to be there. And, but what's good about those trees dying off is after 70, 80 years, then people got called in the court to swear that that was the boundary of the original patent. So it would say, William Hitch got called in the court to verify that that's a, a land record. And by the way, he's 31 years old, and you know, and you know, so, so now you get more details about your family because those trees died off, so. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know if there's any trees, I mean, there probably none left. For, but, but what's interesting is, like back in the Pocomoke Forest, in that area, you can still see lines of trees that mark exactly along the line that original patent was made 250 years ago, so. It, it, was, it was the royal government. Lord Proprietor of Lord Baltimore was representation of the king, you know, and so uh, he gave the right to colonists to patent the land with the, with the provision that the colonists would pay him rent every year, you know, so that's the, that's the patent. And, that, and the government was involved. And um, so, am I saying that right, Ray? I don't, sometimes there's a little, little different nuances to the definition. So these leaseholds were automatically converted at the revolution to actual outright ownership? Well, I mean, you can find, I get called from, Marilyn Williams is a surveyor in Wacomico County. She's called me before and said, we're having trouble with this original patent from the early 1700s over in Willards, you know? And I, she goes all, they go all the way back to that and then try to bring it, try to bring it to, the, uh, to, the, to the modern day and show how the land changed hands. If, if they run into problems with transfer of property and that kind of thing, well, I own this, no, I own this. And then they go all the way back and trace it back to the modern day, so. But, but you had to be pretty wealthy to be a landowner. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very analogous to us paying property taxes today. Yeah. I mean. Well, that's where it comes from. Yeah. So, I mean, if you pay, uh, you know, if you got, if you pay $1,000 a year in property taxes, it's probably equal to four shillings, you know, back in, you know, same, same type of thing. Sharon, you had a question? Um, well, how would you go about, like, I would like to find out the history of the property we live on now, which is not family property. Renter, secu renter security. Renters yeah. security. Yeah. I'll send you all information. I've got, I've got, because I, I lived right next to them <laughs> back then. I've got the whole genealogy of that, and who owned it, Johnson's, and all the way back. Tho Thomas Wrencher, the name Wrencher got corrupted to Renshaw later. You see Renshaw name. Um, patented that land roughly 1715. And the Wrenchers are originally across the river. That's, that's in Mount Vernon now, Ray, if you, just to, for your information. But they're, they're originally across the river. Uh, Thomas Shiles and the Wrencher. Thomas Shiles married a Wrencher. Shiles Creek right across. Yeah, yeah. That's all in that area. So uh, it's Wrencher security, uh, that, whole, that whole area. And, and there's a couple more down, for, um, down to your east. I can, I, can, I can send that to you. So if I forget, send me a note to Mike Hitch at MikeHitch.com. Some of my hitches from Rock Walking wandered this way with the Weatherly family and, and, and down south of here and, uh, and the Twillies, some of those were over here too. And, and, and you look at the old judicial record, have you ever tried those yet, the old Somerset judicial? Well, it is filled with land disputes, um, people getting in trouble like not paying, not paying so they're in debt, or fornication which a lot of bastardy cases in there. So it's unfortunate, but they're, they're rather puritanical, but they were also pretty <laughs> aloof. So one of my Solomon Hitch guys got in trouble with Charity Porter. So the Porter family and the Hitch family somehow combined and never got married. And then 
uh, one of the Hitch girls with Solomon Hitch, they, they were a pretty loose family, evidently. She messed around with Robert Twilley. So, I, I guess there's nothing else to do down in Barron Creek Springs back in those days. <laughs> and this is back in the 1730s, so I mean, way back. I don't know if this goes, I don't know when it became Minxville. The land record database can get you to about 1800. So if it was called that before then, then it would show up in there. If not, then it might have been later. But you can write me, write me in, uh, and let me know. Mike Hitch at MikeHitch.com, yeah. You got it? That's one thing easier to remember in my email. So, so you got to read my MikeHitchBlog.com. Mike uh, James Morris, uh, one of his desk from the 1820s is in the NAB Center. He got willed land outside of Fruitland from William Pollitt. And, and I remember growing up, there was a little family graveyard in that area. And there was a, on, on uh, Jerry McGrath's land now, which was, um, which was Johnson land, and before that Morris land, before that Pollock land. But the um, only thing in that graveyard was a, a, a big stone, which stones aren't around here, but, it, but nothing carved on it. And there was an old cedar tree. And one of the graves had caved in. And they, they told us kids, we were about 10 at the time, that um, that was an old slave and or Native American graveyard. But you look at a crypt, it was brick. No slave or no Indian got a brick crypt, you know. So I'm sure it's James Morris and probably William Pollock living back then. And James Morris died 1870. William Pollock died 1810, something like that time frame. So those family graveyards will show up on some of these land records, especially deeds. So if you go into the deed record, you'll see the graveyard. I've searched for one from my hitch property. In 1909, a guy left his land. He says, and the graveyard to be, be kept to, so people could visit anytime they wanted. Well, that graveyard's gone, man. And if you go down to the Oyster House, I don't know if you've ever gone down to the Oyster House on Oyster House Road in Mount Vernon, riprap along the river there, there's, there's gravestones. I saw, I saw 20 gravestones down in there. People just, farmers take them up and don't care and plow them under. Now, I'm sure the people don't care, but families might care, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, if you have cemetery land, you're supposed to, you're supposed to keep it kind of good, in good shape, but it's not enforceable. James Trader, who used to go to the NAB Center, he used to fight those all the time, really? but yeah. Well, you've got turned off a lot of them because you were back there. Those were yeah, I got poison <laughs> ivy on a lot of them, too. And ticks. It, they're more... <sighs> Ed Otter, um, who's a, kind of an archaeologist historian around here, he's one that dresses up Pemberton a lot uh, in the, in the 17th, 18th century outfit. Um, Purdue bought a big plot of land north of Del Mar, and on that land was an old Hastings cemetery, Archelaus Hastings. Is that how you say it? Yeah, I think it's Archelaus. And Archelaus was the son of my fifth great grandfather, Frederick Hastings. So what they did was, since Purdue didn't want to, they didn't want to get in any kind of trouble, they had an archaeologist come out and they dug, they didn't dig the graves completely up, but they dug down in the earth so you could see the grave outlines. And say, he said, and, and he, he's got a nice picture of all these odd graves laid out from people that had been buried there from about 1800 to about 1870. And uh, one of those graves is Frederick Hastings, one of them's Archelaus. And, and so that's the kind of thing that happens only in the commercial if a, if a private citizen buys it, like I say, these farmers, they don't, a lot of farmers don't care, and they'll just take the stones, throw them in the woods, and plow it under, and that's what happened to this one graveyard, I'm sure. Speaking of the Elliots, there's a, there's a develop, oh, this is in Maryland, though. There's a development on Line Road out east of Del Mar, but it's on the Maryland side, and, and there's a cemetery right there. It still sits in the middle of this development. Uh, that's Benjamin Elliot, so. Dan Parsons on the on the uh, NAB board. He's Mr. Sussex. So, Mr. Sussex. <laughs> well, I showed you that table. John was trying to find his people, and he, he came across these hundred properties. And, and and the Hall of Records doesn't do a good job of laying out where it was in the first place. And like I say, that some were living in Delaware and some were in Maryland when they actually were in the same place because it's different time frames. And so he got just got so frustrated with it. It's like okay. <laughs> You know, I've got, I got three sticks of wood, I'm going to build a house. <laughs> so that's what he did. He, he got, he got 12,000 sticks of wood and built a whole house out of it. The Laurel Hitches are a branch. Um, so um, Adam, Hitch, Adam Hitch settled 
in the Rockawalkin area about 1685. And he had, he had four wives that I know of. He had kids with two of them, uh, kids that survived. Now, he may have had kids with other ones. One was an Elgate, which is not my line. One was Anne somebody who, and a couple of births are listed in the old Somerset land records. William Hitch was born in 1687. His son, William, William John, John William, his son ended up going up and living about where Moore's Chapel is, which was Somerset County back then. And then suddenly it becomes Sussex County. And I, I thought they had moved, but they didn't. They, and they sort of drifted that way. So, so it goes all the way back to then, but all those hitches are, are related through the Adam Hitch line. Adam Hitch, who lived here, I mean, there's hitches in California, Indiana, Ohio. They all moved west, Kentucky, you know, standard migration routes. They all descend from the same guy here. Luckily, Hitch is, an easy, is, is a rare surname, not like Jones. I have two lines of Joneses, one's from Mount Vernon and one's from Fruitland, and they're hard to, you know, hard to keep up with the Joneses, literally, because there's so many of them, and they're all William and John's. Just talking about William and John's story, so Adam Hitch had son William and Solomon and John. Well, William had a son named William. Solomon had a son named William. William Jr. was Solomon's son, not William's son. William's son was William the Younger because William's son was younger than Solomon's son. Right. And then about 20 years later, Solomon's son becomes William Sr. And William the Younger becomes William Jr. And they're not even, they're in the same family, but they're not the same line. You know? So you got, you got to be careful with those things, man. Just, I think just because a lot of lines went through waterways and made it easy. Politics. But, but yeah, but, but. population. Yeah, population. So, so the first courthouse in Somerset, actually the second courthouse, but I'm going to call it the first, was down at Dividing Creek Road, down there on Dividing Creek and the Pocomoke River. Adam Hitch lived in Rockawalkin. Imagine getting down there to go to court. Um, you know, he, he, he was on the pettit jury and the grand jury, and he was called into court, land disputes, and he, he'd have to go all the way down there. That's, a, that's 25, 30 miles. That's a day's ride. You know, I mean, it might be, if you've got a single horse, maybe you can get down there quicker because it's not an easy way to go by water to, from here to there. I mean, some people, a lot of people went the water up the Pocomog Dividing Creek. So as population increased, it became logistically harder for all these people to get down to Dividing Creek so they split the county down the middle, moved the courthouse over to Princess Anne, and then the Worcester County Courthouse to Snow Hill, now you're sort of centralized again, you know? Same thing with Sussex County. Sussex County was just a little thing up north then, and it was Lewistown, right? Um, and, then, and then when, when Sussex was fully developed into its current shape back in the 1776 time frame, then it moved over to Georgetown because that was more central. You know, people over living over here on, on, the, on the point of Delaware didn't want to go all the way to Lewis, you know, and, and the old time horse and buggy, so they moved it inland a little bit to satisfy, you know, some of the logistics going on. So th that's kind of what happened. My, uh, my grandfather, my great grandfather, when he was courting for my great grandmother, Virginia Jones, in Mount Vernon, he lived in Fruitland. Uh, this is the 1890s. He would take off with a mule and a horse and buggy, a buckboard they called it drive 16 miles to Mount Vernon, do his courting all day. Hope he wasn't doing the stuff to get him in trouble. <laughs> and then when it came time to go home in the evening, he would get in the back of the buckboard, sick the mule, and the mule would go home. He'd sleep in the back. And the mule would go all 16 miles all the way home and go in the barn, and then uh, he'd get up. And, so, a lot simpler times back then. <clears throat> this is why I hate Ulysses Grant. <laughs> Even though I like him, I'd have a drink with him, but he burned Richmond in the Civil War, and a lot of the records got burned. So, so to recreate, luckily, being remote, Accomack and Northampton, their records were in their courthouses. They were unscathed by burning in Richmond. But James City County, Surrey County, w Williamsburg, they're all in Richmond, and they got burned. So in 17, uh, 1623, John Hitch of London buys a share in the Virginia Company of London. He's going to get rich with his share of stock. The Virginia Company is going to find gold. He's going to be a multimillionaire. Well, the Virginia Company went bust <laughs> two years later. And so to satisfy the shareholders, they gave him 100 acres of land in the New World for every share of stock they had. So John Hitch shows up in the muster of 1624 and 25 in James City County 
on Jamestown Island. I'm, I'm, I'm almost positive he was the grandfather of Adam Hitch here, but there's no link proving it because of the land records were burned. And, and so, so I got off the, the chain of thought on your original question. So, Coming from so, so they, came, they came from England. They went to Massachusetts, Massachusetts Bay in 1620. They came to Jamestown. You correct me, I'm, I'm, I'm stretching the truth there. They came to Jamestown as adventurers for the Virginia Company. Um, and they came for a lot, lot of times for religious freedom and that kind of stuff. Um, a lot of people that are here came to Virginia first and up, up the eastern shore. And so the strategic plan for Lord Baltimore, Calvert, a Catholic, he, wasn't getting, he wanted to get his land settled as quickly as possible so he could hold charter to it. He wanted to promote people settling on his land in Somerset. So he said, I welcome all religions, religious tolerance. So the Quakers, who were you know, persecuted down in Virginia and to some extent, unless you were really rich, and other, other denominations, Protestants, that kind of stuff, they, they kind of migrated north into Maryland because, you know, there's not big time Church of England folks down in uh, down in Virginia. And, and, and plus, especially the eastern shore of Virginia, the land was wearing out quick, so, and, the natu and, and the population was growing, so the natural migration also did that. But I'm fine. I, I didn't know it. I thought that my, a lot of my guys came directly to Maryland, but I think most of them came up from Virginia. I mean, I got Denstons, the Puseys, the uh, Driscolls. He, he, he was good strategy-wise with the people, but he wasn't very good dealing with the land. Because the, the Maryland-Delaware line was supposed to be Cape Henlopen. <laughs> and the middle point should have been further out on Taylor's Island, so it should have been west. So, which, I mean, east, excuse me. So it should have been... Uh, with the land records, don't, you don't get a lot of feel for the indentured servants and, and, uh, and those... The, the, I don't call them lower class, but the, the, the less gentry class level. Ray talked about our second book they rewrote, uh, Eleanor Mowbray and myself. Eleanor is uh, this nice southern y'all woman from South Carolina near Greenville. Greenville. So she found out about my hitch book and wrote me and said, I found a box of letters in my attic. And it was like 109 letters. One was an old math book from 1806. And in it is written Somerset County, but, they, but they're living in Lorenz County, South Carolina. Well, it was one group of hitches, Luther Hitch, who served in the revolution, moved down there in around 1798 or so. And um, I think the reason he moved, because all the land was burnt out up here, and that rich, fertile, upland uh, South Carolina land was very, uh, very uh, big draw. And so that whole hitch line down there just came, just grew like crazy. And it, it makes you wonder, you know, talk about North against the South. You know, and, and one line from 1765 moved to Massachusetts and became in the whaling business and the international trade business and sail making. And then during the, during the Civil War, sail making got converted to tent making because you make tents for the Union Army. Same family, cousins of each other, but one generation grew up in Massachusetts, another gener the other generation grew up in South Carolina, different ideologies, you know, totally different ideologies, but it's just, it's just intriguing to me. And we wrote the book about about those letters and how he traveled throughout the South. He ends up getting killed in Kennesaw Mountain. And the reason why the book's named Old Lordy is because in June 20th, his, um, his colleague, Private William Scruggs, Scruggs, writes home to his wife, um, Mary Hitch, and said, Mary, sorry to tell you, your dear husband is dead. He, he, was, he was shooting at Yankees behind the breastwork. He, he leaned down to reload his gun. He was struck in the head by a mini ball. And his last words were, oh, Lordy. <laughs> and so literally, that was his last words. And so we wrote the book about that. And um, just, 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 and, and, and throughout the book, so I know all the hitches that served in the Civil War, both Union and Confederate. And the Battle of Chickamauga, Georgia, there were, there were, you hear about brother fighting brother. Well, they weren't brothers, but they were cousins, literally on each side. They probably didn't know it. One may have shot the other one. I didn't realize who it was, you know. But that, that was truly was how our country was divided back then. And, you know, I, the different theories about the war. There's ideolo ideologies at the, at, the, at the lowly level like us, and then there's government ideology that drives uh, artificial stuff, too, that 
So who knows if it was a power play by the north or the south or whatever. So 